been some very confusing, to be quite honest, confusing coverage in the mainstream media about what's going on in South Africa. So I wanted to clarify it, given the data that we have actually from South Africa itself. So important because where South Africa is now, the UK is following over the next two to three weeks. The United States will be following after that and by extension the rest of the world will be following at various paces after the South Africa example. Now, here we see the situation. Now, uh, India and Japan, thankfully, very low cases. That's good. Canada, they're going up slightly. Now, this is the Omicron surge in South Africa. But if you look at relative number of cases, it's only up to where the United States is now. Now, South Africa will be carrying on increasing. There's no question about that. But this is Delta in the United States and Omicron in South Africa. And the United Kingdom, where we've actually got a bit of both at the moment, well, we see cases dramatically increasing with a record number of new cases reported today, actually, for the 15th. New weekly hospital admissions, United States are already high, Delta driven. These are Delta based hospital admissions in the States. United Kingdom, again, these hospitalizations are virtually entirely Delta, virtually entirely. South Africa, they're virtually entirely, well, they probably are now entirely uh, Omicron. And we see in South Africa that Omicron is now 98%. Now, this is such an important slide because what this means is the Omicron has displaced the Delta. It's not as well as, it's instead of. Delta is now finished, basically, in South Africa. Omicron has displaced it completely. The vast majority of children not getting sick and most children that were hospitalised being incidental findings. Now, it looks like the main features of Omicron infection in the UK so far are most commonly a runny nose, second, a headache, Thirdly, fatigue, which can be mild or quite severe, a varying presentation of fatigue, sneezing and a sore throat. They are the symptoms that have been identified so far as the most likely uh, presenting symptoms in, those, in that order for uh, Omicron infection in the UK. The implication is obvious. If you have any of these and uh, you've had colds in the past, you're going to think it's a cold, but it may well not be. It may be an Omicron cold need to get tested. Uh, new daily confirmed COVID-19 cases. Now, Denmark is remarkably high for new cases. But of course, what we have to remember is Denmark has the best sequencing capacity in the world by far. So it's not surprising that they're picking up more cases. So Denmark, we see, are picking up a lot of new cases. Then United Kingdom, Ireland, United States. Now, is this just the start of the upward deflection that we're seeing in the United States data indicating the start of Omicron? Uh, the answer to that question is uh, probably, from what we know, probably. It looks like the Omicron surge is just about to start in the United States as we speak. Uh, Canada, uh, upward trend as well. Japan, uh, thankfully, still um, bumping along at the zero mark, which is, which is great news and also fascinating. Number of uh, COVID-19 patients in hospital per million. So the United States still high. Denmark, Canada, relatively lower. United Kingdom and Ireland comparable. And the fact that the hospitalizations have been going up in Denmark, but nothing like in proportion to the increase in testing, indicating that they're picking up a lot more cases than most other countries. Now, slight difference in the presentation in South Africa. We looked at this before. So in South Africa, a blocked or runny nose, uh, check, that's the same. Headache, check, that's the same. Tiredness, check, that's the same. Uh, now, London, in the UK, it's described as a sore throat. In South Africa, it's described as a, a scratchy or sore throat. So I think that's the same. The big difference is um, in the UK data, fatigue is a much more prominent feature, although we know there was fatigue in the uh, South Africa data. But the body aches were a prominent feature in South Africa, whereas that doesn't seem to be such a feature in the London data. Now, why is this? Could it be that um, body aches are more likely to break through as a symptom in people that have had previous actual um, SARS coronavirus 2 infection because we know that's where the majority of the immunity comes from in South Africa whereas maybe the vaccine because we know the majority of immunity in the UK comes from vaccination the vaccine provides more protectiveness against body aches that, 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 that could be that could be the case as far as the UK is looking and I've no reason to suspect this will be any different in the United States or Europe or anywhere else this is in most people presenting as a cold 
mild and self-limiting in the vast majority of cases. NHS official symptoms, a high temperature, a new continuous cough, loss change in your sense of smell or taste. I mean, this is just 18 months out of date. Now it can present like this, but we know from contemporary data, and we like to be up to date, that that's what we get from the Zoe Symptom Tracker data. That's what we've got from the clinicians on the ground in South Africa. This is what we continue to get from the NHS in the UK. So yes, it could present as a high temperature. Yes, it could present as a new continuous cough. Yes, there could be a loss of the change of sense of taste or smell, but normally not. Let's look at uh, flu and um, cold-like illnesses. And as you can see from the graph here, we're seeing large numbers of uh, other respiratory viruses. This is the, the curve in yellow, and they're still going up, uh, actually faster than COVID itself. And that might be uh, the, the season and the fact that people are getting together for large parties and gatherings, and all these viruses have had nowhere to spread for in recent months. Uh, now, currently we know that most uh, of the common symptoms of Omicron are exactly the same as you're getting from these other respiratory viruses. Very hard to uh, tell the difference. And it, it, the ratio of one to the other is changing, but uh, at the moment it's because of the high rates of other viruses, it's about a one in five chance of uh, it being due to uh, COVID, which is, depending on where you are in the country, a mixture of Omicron and Delta. That's still pretty high, so uh, do be aware of that and, and do get lateral flow tested. Omicron is set to be the dominant uh, variant by Christmas in the UK, and cases could well hit a peak higher than anything we've seen before uh, in the new year. But if the symptoms continue to be mild, uh, this is good news. And I think we might end up seeing a, an equilibrium where this, uh, this virus uh, doesn't get eliminated, but it just gets to low manageable levels. Still no reason to be complacent because uh, some people can still get long COVID. It can affect people with other uh, health conditions, uh, etc., and hospitalization is still going to be more likely uh, than with a common cold. Um, the latest advice is to uh, take uh, daily lateral flow tests, um, and I think this is uh, quite wise if you can get hold of them, particularly just before family gatherings, but also make sure no one else has any cold like symptoms. Uh, because uh, that's a really good way of avoiding uh, super spreading events. Uh, I personally don't believe some of these uh, gloomy predictions uh, of uh, over 200,000 cases a day and uh, two to 5,000 hospitalizations a day, as I think that uh, we're already seeing people's cha behavior change, and that is the biggest factor that actually reduces the number of cases. And we've started to see that in London uh, soon. So I think all these models don't take that into account. And uh, whereas, so I don't think there is total gloom and doom, uh, but we all have to play our part. And if generally we change our behavior, we can keep this all uh, pretty manageable. This, we have tough times ahead that the numbers are rising. Um, and just this week, I got alerted um, from one of our local uh, systems that we have a severe shortage of monoclonal therapy. Um, and at least locally at this one institution, well, it's not just one, but this network of institutions, um, they're no longer offering post-exposure prophylaxis with the monoclonals. Um, and they are restricting um, use only to either unvaccinated, not fully vaccinated, or individuals not expected to mount an adequate immune response as defined by the CDC or age greater than equal to 65. Um, so this is this is tough, right? This is, um, you know, I certainly have had patients in the past who have thought like, it's okay if I get COVID, I'm going to go, I'm going to get my monoclonals. Um, I've done all the other things. Well, this might not be an option. Um, and, you know, I'm hoping at some point, right, the majority of cases will be in the vaccinated because we, we have clear evidence that a vaccinated person who gets infected is at lower risk, you know, mm -hmm. from where they started. 
um, you know, you take a healthy, healthy woman in their thirties, fully vaccinated. We'll figure out what that means at some point. Um, if they get infected, we expect them to do quite well. The college students, right? We're talking about 20 year olds, healthy, um, you know, we expect them to do very well post-vaccination. What we worry most about is um, people who are older, people with comorbidities, even if they're vaccinated, as we've discussed, they still can end up having having troubles. Well, I have to say across our country, this is still dominantly Delta, um, but the CDC breaks down the U.S. into different regions um, with regard to variant tracking. Um, and our region locally here um, is region two. And, and this includes New York, New Jersey, and Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, and, you know, the the data on um, variants is always a little outdated, right? Because the person gets diagnosed, the virus gets sequenced, then we get the news. Mm -hmm. So we have news for the week ending December 11th. Um, so this is old, but we were already over 13% in our local region for Omicron. Um, I'm hearing that we may be up in the 30s, uh, the time we get data for the current week we're in. So the, this current trajectory puts um, puts Omicron as the dominant variant, um, well, before the end of January, if not sooner. Um, and with all the travel, we're expecting um, Region 2 to be um, cross-pollinating the, the rest of the country. So you saw with Delta, um, there was a shorter time from exposure to the time you would transmit to the next person. That's important for us to know clinically. Um, is it about immune evasion? Um, is this going to be something we don't see in people who get a third shot, but do see in people who had a prior infection? So the immune evasion question is going to be important for us. Um, is there a lower inoculum, right? We still talk about this, you know, when we have contact tracing 15 minutes within six feet, we talk about indoors versus outdoors, um, is five minutes, you know, so we, we need to get a sense of that as well. Um, is there a longer transmissibility period, right? We're still using the same, you know, isolation of the infected for 10 days. Um, I think we've talked about before with the vaccinated, I'm not sure we need to be doing that for as long. Um, but then the question comes um, with Omicron, is it longer? You know, by the time you get to 11, is it fine to send that individual to a Christmas party with, you know, the elderly parents? Um, but mRNA booster immunizations in vaccinated and convalescent individuals resulted in a significant increase in serum neutralizing activity against Omicron. So that's a the little bit of, of good news, a little more like um, maybe the boosters are something that is going to help us in this situation. Delays impact the efficacy of monoclonal therapy. So even though we say you have a 10-day window, the first three days is the most effective, the next six days continue to be quite effective. If you get past day six, your efficacy drops in half compared to giving it in those first six days. Um, we are hoping that people who have been infected before are less likely to get um, infected again. And I, but let me share a story. I got this call earlier today, busy day. Um, and this is a woman who um, is a healthcare worker. Um, she was initially infected in March 2020, so right in the early days, had COVID then for the first time. Um, but she decides, instead of getting vaccinated, she's going to track her antibody levels. Um, she's testing them regularly. They continue to be very high. As my wife asked, who's paying for all those antibody tests? I guess our insurance companies are. Um, so she's feeling good. She's got this high level. She decides not to get vaccinated. She is planning on getting pregnant, but she is going to a, um, an OB. Um, and doing in vitro fertilization. Um, the day before that in vitro fertilization appointment, she isn't feeling well, and she is required to get tested by the OB. And lo and behold, despite her very high antibody levels, um, she ends with, uh, with COVID this second time. Um, she goes, she gets monoclonal antibodies. I'm not sure what the indication was, but she does um, because she's not pregnant at this point. Um, so now 90 days pass, but she's still tracking those high antibody levels. She's now pregnant. Um, she somehow gets an OB to write her an exemption letter um, saying that because she is pregnant, she shouldn't get vaccinated. And now today I get a call because she again tested positive for COVID. Um, so I just want to point out, and this is a perfect example, because people people want to go ahead and they want to draw those serology tests. They want to feel like if those levels stay high, that they're not going to end up getting reinfected or infected post-vaccine. Um, but clearly, as we keep sharing here, we are seeing 
Um, and we are getting this reported in the thousands. Reinfections, re-reinfections, and now even re-re-reinfections. So fourth infections in less than two years. This looks like this young lady has had her third infection um, in the last two years.